preface of the best church hymns this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales the best church hymns by lewis f benson preface this little book had its origin in two papers prepared at the request of the editor of the sunday school times and printed in that journal in the autumn of eighteen ninety seven they are now by his courteous permission substantially reproduced here as there recorded the collation covered ninety-eight hymn-books and is now brought down to cover nine more not then at hand or since published it is interesting to note that this enlargement of the material effected no change in the list of the best hymns except in some cases a change in their relative order and the addition of one more hymn to their fellowship but the better part of the book is the hymns themselves as far as practicable they are printed as their authors wrote them such accepted alterations as it seemed necessary to adopt being referred to in the notes the text of the hymns reproduces in all respects that prepared by the editors for the hymnal of the presbyterian church published in eighteen ninety five each hymn is preceded by the title given to it by the author which often helps us to read the hymn from his point of view and the hymn is followed by a very brief sketch setting forth something of its history and by notes intended to explain any words which are not at once clear as well as to call attention to the scriptural allusions of the hymn a word of apology perhaps should be spoken for the simplicity of these annotations they must be understood as intended to appeal to the minds of the children who it is hoped may be encouraged to lay up these hymns in their memories it being the intention of the publishers to issue the pages containing the hymns and annotations apart from the preliminary discussions for use as a textbook with that desirable end in view End preface. Introduction, Part One of the Best Church Hymns by Lewis F. Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction, Part One. What are the best hymns? Much of what is written upon the character and quality of our hymns fails either to enlighten or convince and this is because the writer or it may be the reader does not clearly distinguish the two points of view from which hymns may be regarded for hymnody is at once a branch of literature and a branch of liturgics and the characteristics of a hymn are not the same in the two departments in literature for example both coleridge and shelley are looked upon as skilled in the right use of english words and the one published a hymn before sunrise in the vale of chamonix and the other a hymn to intellectual beauty yet from the liturgical point of view these pieces are not in any sense to be recognized as hymns again a piece of verse properly spoken of from a liturgical point of view as a good hymn may seem to a mere literary critic quite unworthy of any such distinction the methods and ends of poetic literature are one thing and the uses of god's house are another and while they do not necessarily conflict they do establish different scales of excellence and they do demand differing criteria of judgment unless we are to have confusion one or the other point of view should be distinctly chosen and then persistently maintained the title of this book suggests that we are dealing now with hymns for church use and that among such hymns we are seeking the best but the mere announcement of that point of view is not enough it must be adhered to and just here it is that confusion so often creeps in some one starts out to test the quality of church hymns and then at once proceeds to test them not by a study of the actual experience of the church in their use but by applying to them his personal opinions and judgment of what a good hymn ought to be he is followed by other critics each with the same aim and method but with differing judgments and each one discovers the hymns that are best in his opinion out of it all comes confusion and no standard is established but the fluctuating one of personal preference 
and now when an interest in hymns is so widely felt is a good time to insist that the quality of a church hymn cannot be determined in that way the hymn is the people's share in god's praise and is intended for congregational use it can be tested only by the results of actual use in the worship of the church and to propose any other test such as the opinions of critics is again to confound literature with liturgics in the case of an untried hymn no man can say that it will prove to be a good hymn in the case of hymns that have been fully offered to the church and set before her to sing and yet have failed to attain any real position in her hymnody that result may be said to mark the end of their career as hymns such hymns have been actually tried by the only competent tribunal have for some reason or other possibly for none that is quite apparent been found wanting here and there a hymn-book editor with a happy knack may light upon one of them which he thinks has not had a fair trial and he may even start it upon a new career mated to some tune that shall help it at last to win its way to the hearts of god's worshippers but this is not to change the tribunal which decides the ultimate fate of all hymns it is only to gain a new hearing before that same tribunal in the specific case and from the decision of that tribunal there is no appeal in the matter of hymns a good hymn is one that commends itself to the church voices the religious feeling of the worshippers and stands the test of congregational use and just because god's people in all the different branches of the church make but one larger congregation with common needs and feelings therefore the only hymns we are entitled to call the best church hymns are those which commend themselves to this larger congregation and have come into actual use over the widest area and by consent of the largest number of christians in the different churches a so-called gospel hymn which has temporary vogue in certain quarters but which the great bodies of christians reject from their worship is not one of the best hymns a wooden translation from the latin dear to the advanced section of the anglican church is not one of the best hymns neither are our own personal favourites necessarily entitled to that distinction which only the church at large can confer if then the church alone decides which hymns are the best and her decision is necessarily final what remains to us is the simple finding of the individual hymns which as a matter of fact have won widest approval and largest use it would be interesting in several ways if we could pick them out of the mass if we could get before us a group of hymns which according to our definition are beyond doubt the best church hymns the only practicable way of doing this is by the study of the hymn books in present use in the churches these books in the case of each denomination are the last of a series which have been successively used there they have grown up by a slow process of dealing with hymns by way of selection and addition they contain all the hymns now actually sung in their worship by taking the whole number of these hymn books then we have the entire body of hymns in actual use in the church worship of english-speaking christians and by collating their contents we could determine what hymns are common to a smaller or greater number of books giving to each book one vote the number of books in which a given hymn is found would determine the status of that hymn in the whole english-speaking church and we should finally arrive at a group of hymns which being found in the widest actual use are properly called the best church hymns this collation however fascinating is a painful task fortunately it has been largely done for us already one dr robert ellis thompson has made such a collation of thirty representative hymn-books of the different bodies of christians in the united states certifying which hymns have received the votes of the seven chief churches of american protestantism these hymns one hundred and fifty-four in number are our american candidates for the distinction of being the best hymns two mr king has done a light work for the anglican church collating fifty-two collections chosen as representative of the hymn-books used in that church and its branches in scotland ireland and the colonies his list of hymns as representing at once the english and the liturgical points of view may be set against dr thompson's 
it will then appear that out of dr thompson's one hundred and fifty-four hymns forty-eight are not found in mr king's list reducing the number of our candidates to one hundred and six three these two collations i have supplemented by a third covering one recent church of england collection twelve representative books used in the church of scotland and in the nonconformist churches of england scotland and canada and twelve important american books published most of them since the date of dr thompson's list the whole number of books collated is thus brought up to one hundred and seven as we are seeking the hymns in widest use only we may take eighty per cent as the proportion of books in which a given hymn must occur to attain the first rank and we then find no less than thirty-two of our one hundred and six hymns fulfilling that requirement in view of the diversities of creed ritual and taste represented in these hymn books this is a remarkable result it seems not unreasonable or unsafe to say that at the present time we may call these thirty-two the best church hymns the following list gives their first lines and the number of votes for each one rock of ages cleft for me a hundred and six two when i survey the wondrous cross a hundred and four three jesus lover of my soul a hundred and four four all praise to thee my god this night a hundred and three five jesus i my cross have taken one hundred and three six son of my soul thou saviour dear a hundred and three seven awake my soul and with the sun one hundred and one eight hark the herald angels sing one hundred and one nine abide with me fast falls the eventide one hundred and one ten jerusalem my happy home one hundred and one eleven how sweet the name of jesus sounds one hundred and one twelve nearer my god to thee one hundred thirteen from greenland's icy mountains one hundred fourteen our god our help in ages past one hundred fifteen jerusalem the golden ninety nine sixteen lo he comes with clouds descending ninety four seventeen jesus shall reign where'er the sun ninety four eighteen glorious things of thee are spoken ninety three nineteen hark the glad sound the saviour comes ninety two twenty come let us join our cheerful songs ninety two twenty one all hail the power of jesus name ninety two twenty two hail to the lord's anointed ninety one twenty three o worship the king ninety one twenty four christ the lord is risen to-day ninety twenty five guide me o thou great jehovah ninety twenty six just as i am without one plea ninety twenty seven god moves in a mysterious way ninety twenty eight jesus the very thought of thee eighty nine twenty nine children of the heavenly king eighty seven thirty there is a land of pure delight eighty seven thirty one thou whose almighty word eighty six thirty two brief life is here our portion eighty six we may read this list with much satisfaction with a new confidence also in the tribunal which gave such a decision time will work changes in this list but it seems likely that they will be by way of addition rather than of subtraction heber's holy 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 lord god almighty and newman's lead kindly light for instance will apparently very soon range with these others but of the thirty-two few indeed seem likely to be superseded in our time none could now be spared a competent editor of a hymn-book for church use at the present time would hesitate before omitting any one of them they are indeed the best church hymns and now that we have them clearly before us two uses of this list suggest themselves one a duty is suggested to those who are concerned in the conduct of public worship the leader of public worship has few responsibilities greater than the choice of hymns to be sung the influence of familiar hymns is very great and these certainly would seem to be the hymns that should become familiar by a reasonably frequent use two an opportunity is suggested to those who are interested in the religious training of children how could more be done for the spiritual enrichment of a child than by storing its memory with the best hymns 
if the good old custom of memorizing hymns has fallen into abeyance it may have been from the embarrassment of riches the discouraging length of the list of available hymns but here is a short list of the best only presenting a task not too great for the average scholar making frequent review possible and offering a treasure which will grow only the greater as life lengthens out and until its close it is not surely a thought to be lightly passed over as mr ellerton has said it is not without a lesson of deep significance for us all that our divine master sustained his spirit upon his awful deathbed not with any new utterance of devotion not with aspirations come fresh from the lips of him who spake as never man spake but with the familiar words of his church's psalmody the broken fragments of the hymnal of his childhood it will be of interest also to examine the hymns included in our list so as to gain an impression of what the qualities are which make up the standard of a hymn that the church approves and loves to use end of introduction part one introduction part two of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction part two what is to-day the standard of the best church hymns we have now reached an understanding as to what may rightly be called the best church hymns we have seen that while every one is at liberty to choose the hymns that are best to him only the church decides which are the best church hymns the church hymn is intended for church use and the best hymns are those which do as a matter of fact fulfil that use those in other words which have won the widest approval and use by the church we have before us a list of the thirty-two best hymns what remains is to examine the characteristics of these hymns so as to gain an answer to the question what is to-day the standard of the best church hymns of these thirty-two hymns only two are of the seventeenth century bishop kin's awake my soul and with the sun and his all praise to thee my god this night of the eighteenth century dr watts leads with five when i surveyed the wondrous cross our god our help in ages past come let us join our cheerful songs jesus shall reign where'er the sun and there is a land of pure delight charles wesley follows with four jesus lover of my soul hark the herald angels sing christ the lord is risen to-day and lo he comes with clouds descending john newton with two how sweet the name of jesus sounds and glorious things of thee are spoken and these others with one each toplady rock of ages doddridge hark the glad sound the saviour comes pernet all hail the power of jesus name cooper god moves in a mysterious way williams guide me o thou great jehovah and senec children of the heavenly king of the nineteenth century light leads with two abide with me and jesus i my cross have taken and these writers have one each keble son of my soul adams nearer my god to thee heber from greenland's icy mountains montgomery hail to the lord anointed grant o worship the king marriott thou whose almighty word eliot just as i am and the anonymous recast of an older hymn jerusalem my happy home of the nineteenth century also are three versions of latin hymns neil's jerusalem the golden and brief life is here our portion and caswall's jesus the very thought of thee the first thing the reading of this list suggests is the catholicity of the church's judgment for roman anglican independent moravian wesleyan and unitarian alike are allowed to contribute to it the church's unity indeed is foreshadowed in her hymnody one is impressed also with the absence from this list of all recent hymns the latest of them was in print by eighteen fifty one at first this would seem to indicate the judgment of the church that in hymnody the old is better 
but the fact is rather that a hymn makes its way slowly and naturally it takes a great while for any hymn to attain a use so general and widespread and among so many branches of the church one seeking now the characteristics of these best church hymns we may begin with their lyrical quality they are adapted for setting to music and singing with the exception perhaps of watts's jesus shall reign you would choose to sing them rather than to read them we put this lyrical quality first as most naturally to be expected of a hymn but historically it was by no means the first to be insisted upon our fathers began with versions of the psalms which were anything but lyrical and the hymns which succeeded them were often hardly more singable some of these linger yet watts's go preach my gospel is as honest prose as man ever wrote and in the case of a class of hymns such as tis a point i long to know and how sad our state by nature is nothing but an inherited tradition could account for a proposal to sing any one of them gradually with the growth of musical feeling the heavy hymns are being left behind already the church has decided that only lyrics can find a place among the best hymns two we note again the literary excellence of all these hymns no less than eleven of the thirty-two are included by mr palgrave in his very exclusive treasury as literature poetry for poetry's sake and three others by mr steadman in his victorian anthology including nearer my god to thee the faultiest of them all but saved in an art sense by the beauty of its interwoven refrain one other when i survey etc matthew arnold considered the finest hymn in the language and of the remainder representing such writers as wesley watts heber montgomery cooper caswell neal and grant there is none without distinct literary merit analyzing this literary excellence we find that each one has a single theme giving unity to the hymn and a proper development of it giving life and movement to the verses the weaker and less sung verses of jesus lover of my soul being an exception these themes are poetically sound and their treatment is interesting the language is refined and beautiful the images happy with an occasional lapse as in the unfortunate stony griefs of nearer my god to thee and in all and over all that winning grace of simplicity simplicity always stands for much but in a hymn which must have the gift of a quick appeal to many differing minds simplicity stands for fundamentals literary excellence then is a marked common feature of the best hymns this means that the church at large has not accepted a hymn of inferior literary qualities and in view of the advance of general culture it leaves the very comfortable assurance that she never will Three we note again that each of these hymns has liturgical propriety both in the subject matter and in the form they keep within the subjects proper to public devotions but within that limit they range freely through the whole sphere of worship now praise is the chief act of worship but it is by no means the only one prayer is an act of worship and the expression of our aspirations is an act of worship these hymns include both the element of praise is not quite absent from any of them perhaps but not many could be classed as technically hymns of praise this fact has its own importance just now for in the reaction from the use of sentimental and egotistical hymns that make much of ourselves and little of god and his christ quite a party has grown up which maintains that the only proper theme of a hymn is the adoration and praise of god didactics and invitation supplication and intercession they say are provided for elsewhere in the service and they would return to the definition of st augustine that hymns are the praise of god with song welcome as is the reaction the movement while in the right direction is too radical it needs to be corrected by the verdict of the church and this verdict must settle the liturgical office of a hymn 
a good hymn is not necessarily a form of pure praise but rather a form of worship and it may take its theme from any of the proper parts of public worship let us go now a little deeper to look for the spiritual qualities which have given these hymns so long a life so universal acceptance these seem especially to be two one of them is reverence and the other is reality for that tone of reverence pervades every one of these hymns it sounds all the way from the majestic heights of watts's our god our help in ages past which celebrates his eternity and unchangeableness to the familiar levels of ken's morning and evening hymns in which the little things of life are brought into that same august presence any one can test this quality of reverence for himself in several ways the most natural way would be to read or sing the hymn over and observe the effect upon himself how that they clothe his own mood with reverence another way more effective if one cared to try it were that of singing any of these hymns to trivial melodies in rapid time and with careless manner but the test is rather that one would not care to do that the quality of the hymn makes the performance irreverent and it is no doubt this quality of reverence which gives to a hymn its hymnic character makes it suitable for use in the church's worship whether it be directly addressed to god or whether it be in the form of praise or of prayer is not the real test of the hymn's fitness but whether it be of the quality of reverence and just here just where the best hymns are strong is where so many of the hymns which are in current evangelistic use begin to fail they fail in other things but they begin to fail at the very foundation for in the worship of god there is no other foundation laid than is already laid in reverence and a hymn may not be so gross as to be irreverent and yet it may lack reverence in conception and in expression and especially in the feelings it tends to excite in those who sing or hear it a hymn may lack reverence but a good hymn cannot lack it the best hymns are thrilled with it through and through five then there is that other of these deeper qualities which are common to all our group the quality of spiritual reality it has two sides one turned outward toward the world of things spiritual the side of truth and one turned inward toward spiritual experience the side of sincerity and only so would god be worshipped in sincerity and in truth a hymn therefore as an acceptable act of worship must be true to facts and must be sincerely spoken by the singers there are untrue hymns and an untrue hymn is no better because the misrepresentations are veiled under poetic diction addison's how are thy servants blessed o lord in the altered form as used in the hymn books and drapers ye christian heralds go proclaim as generally used in the original text are examples of untrue hymns and there are many hymns which put into the mouths of an ordinary congregation are quite insincere the hymns for instance which express a desire for immediate death or more generally which say to god things which the singers do not feel or do not believe a congregation will sing such hymns thoughtlessly if they are set to music that is seductive but certainly it is a serious responsibility to place such hymns in the order of worship there are untrue hymns and insincere hymns but the best church hymns as they are now set before us are neither they are marked by spiritual reality they express that is to say spiritual truths which are within the people's apprehension and sound spiritual feelings which are not beyond the experience of the average christian worshipper this is true of them in a very marked degree but are there no exceptions we turn instinctively to the new jerusalem hymns jerusalem the golden and jerusalem my happy home canon kingsley protested against such hymns as unreal but surely it is carrying the manly and robust type of religion pretty far to exclude aspirations after heaven from our christian hymnody 
it is rather the class of hymns represented by faber's o paradise that are open to such objection it is interesting to compare this recast jerusalem my happy home probably montgomery's with the earlier o mother dear jerusalem on which it is based just to see how the right feeling of the recaster has given reality to what was hardly more than a mood of individualistic transcendentalism having poetic truth rather than congregational fitness this spiritual reality in the substance and not a mere plural form is what makes a hymn congregational which fact has its importance to us who are so often reminded that a good hymn must use the plural forms we us our and not i me mine our list contradicts the dictum many of these hymns use the singular pronouns throughout but they are still the best congregational hymns congregational because they express experiences natural and proper to the average christian and if they express them in an individual form they are all the more true to life for our spiritual experiences also are individual with this last note the answer to our question what is to-day the standard of our best church's hymns seems to be complete these are the five elements which enter into that standard first the lyrical quality second literary excellence third liturgical propriety fourth reverence fifth spiritual reality it was interesting to discover which hymns are the best and if our examination of them is careful and true it is an added gain to know what it is that makes them best the verdict of the church is conclusive but it covers only the hymns old enough to have secured a full and wide trial we are left more to our own judgment in dealing with the great body of more recent hymns and from that very fact arises the advantage in determining the standard of the hymns known to be the best so that we may measure the newer candidates for favor by that same standard end of introduction part two hymns one two and three of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain one a living and dying prayer for the holiest believer in the world rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure cleanse me from its guilt and power not the labours of my hands can fulfil thy law's demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears for ever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone nothing in my hand i bring simply to thy cross i cling naked come to thee for dress helpless look to thee for grace foul i to the fountain fly wash me saviour or i die while i draw this fleeting breath when my eyelids close in death when i soar to worlds unknown see thee on thy judgment throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee this hymn properly stands first for it has had great power over the minds of men its author was an english clergyman the rev augustus montague toplady born in seventeen forty he was a man of feeble body but of intense feelings and earnestly opposed the methodist movement in the church of england see under number three the hymn was first printed at the end of an article in the number for march seventeen seventy six of the gospel magazine of which toplady was editor he died in seventeen seventy eight two crucifixion to the world by the cross of christ galatians six fourteen when i survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain i count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride 
forbid it lord that i should boast save in the death of christ my god all the vain things that charm me most i sacrifice them to his blood see from his head his hands his feet sorrow and love flow mingled down did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all a great literary critic matthew arnold thought this the finest hymn in the english language it was written by dr isaac watts a prominent independent clergyman of england born sixteen seventy four died seventeen forty eight dr watts set himself to improve the character of the hymns used in dissenting churches in seventeen o seven to nine he published a book containing three hundred and sixty five of his hymns of which this is one and in seventeen nineteen another volume of free versions or imitations of the psalms they became very popular and for a long time no other hymns than those of dr watts were sung in a great many churches in england and this country he is often called the father of english hymnody this hymn is founded on the text in galatians referred to in its title the thought in both hymn and text is that worldliness dies in my heart when i look on the world's maker dead for me on the cross there were five verses in the hymn as dr watts published it one of which is generally omitted three in temptation jesus lover of my soul let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll while the tempest still is high hide me o my saviour hide till the storm of life is past safe into the haven guide o receive my soul at last other refuge have i none hangs my helpless soul on thee leave ah leave me not alone still support and comfort me all my trust on thee is stayed all my help from thee i bring cover my defenceless head with the shadow of thy wing wilt thou not regard my call wilt thou not accept my prayer lo i sink i faint i fall lo on thee i cast my care reach me out thy gracious hand while i of thy strength receive hoping against hope i stand dying and behold i live thou o christ art all i want more than all in thee i find raise the fallen cheer the faint heal the sick and lead the blind just and holy is thy name i am all unrighteousness false and full of sin i am thou art full of truth and grace plenteous grace with thee is found grace to cover all my sin let the healing streams abound make and keep me pure within thou of life the fountain art freely let me take of thee spring thou up within my heart rise to all eternity of all the hymns in the english language this no doubt is loved the best it was written in seventeen forty by the rev charles wesley born seventeen o seven died seventeen eighty eight he was a clergyman of the church of england and took an active part in the methodist movement in which his brother john was the leader and out of which all the methodist churches have grown the wesleys put great faith in the power of hymns to teach religious truths to the people and to reach their hearts charles wesley wrote more than six thousand hymns some were printed in hymn books to be sung at the methodist meetings and some in tracts to be read and committed to memory at home he was among the greatest of all hymn writers and many of his hymns are sung in all branches of the church note verse one line three nearer waters in a wide expanse of waters a distant part may be lashed into fury by a passing storm 
whilst around a given ship there is perfect calm or the nearer waters may be affected while the distant waters are sleeping in the silent air in life as in nature storms are local and men cry for help not against distant dangers but out of their immediate troubles their life is amid the nearer waters of temptations and to them the lover of souls is indispensable j julian end of part one Hymns 4, 5, and 6 of the Best Church Hymns by Louis F. Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 4. An Evening Hymn All praise to thee, my God, this night, for all the blessings of the light. Keep me, O oh, keep me, King of Kings, beneath thine own almighty wings. Forgive me, Lord, for thy dear Son, the ill that I this day have done that with the world myself and thee i ere i sleep at peace may be teach me to live that i may dread the grave as little as my bed to die that this vile body may rise glorious at the awful day o oh, may my soul on thee repose and with sweet sleep mine eyelids close sleep that may me more vigorous make to serve my god when i awake when in the night i sleepless lie my soul with heavenly thoughts supply let no ill dreams disturb my rest no powers of darkness me molest oh when shall i in endless day forever chase dark sleep away and hymns with the supernal choir incessant sing and never tire this hymn as also number seven was written more than two centuries ago by thomas ken he was born in sixteen thirty seven was educated at winchester college and oxford and became a clergyman we do not know just when he wrote the hymns but he printed them in a little book of prayers he made for the scholars at winchester ken was a good man in a bad time his holy life shines like a good deed in a naughty world he was made bishop of bath and wells by king charles the second who respected him because he was brave but his life was filled with troubles until he died in seventeen eleven his morning and evening hymns still live in millions of hearts there are twelve verses in all in this hymn five lo we have left all and followed thee jesus i my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee destitute despised forsaken thou from hence my all shall be perish every fond ambition all i've sought or hoped or known yet how rich is my condition god and heaven are still my own man may trouble and distress me twill but drive me to thy breast life with trials hard may press me heaven will bring me sweeter rest oh tis not in grief to harm me while thy love is left to me oh twere not in joy to charm me were that joy unmixed with thee take my soul thy full salvation rise o'er sin and fear and care joy to find in every station something still to do or bear think what spirit dwells within thee what a father's smile is thine what a saviour died to win thee child of heaven shouldst thou repine haste then on from grace to glory armed by faith and winged by prayer heaven's eternal days before thee god's own hand shall guide thee there soon shall close thy earthly mission swift shall pass thy pilgrim days hope shall change to glad fruition faith to sight and prayer to praise this hymn was printed as early as eighteen twenty four in six verses but it was many years before even the name of the author was known he was the rev henry francis light curate of an english parish made up mostly of fishermen and sailors and himself a victim of consumption 
but now every one knows and honours his name for he wrote not only this beautiful hymn of consecration but many others and best of all abide with me fast falls the even tide see under number nine six evening st luke twenty four twenty nine son of my soul thou saviour dear it is not night if thou be near o may no earth-born cloud arise to hide thee from thy servant's eyes when the soft dews of kindly sleep my wearied eyelids gently steep be my last thought how sweet to rest for ever on my saviour's breast abide with me from morn till eve for without thee i cannot live abide with me when night is nigh for without thee i dare not die if some poor wandering child of thine have spurned to-day the voice divine now lord the gracious work begin let him no more lie down in sin watch by the sick enrich the poor with blessings from thy boundless store be every mourner's sleep to-night like infant's slumbers pure and light come near and bless us when we wake ere through the world our way we take till in the ocean of thy love we lose ourselves in heaven above in eighteen twenty seven the rev john keble an english clergyman and a true poet published a book of his verses he called it the christian year because it had a poem for each sunday in the year and for all other days and times for which his church appointed services our beautiful and familiar hymn is taken from the second poem in that book called evening end of part two Hymns 7, 8, and 9 of the Best Church Hymns by Lewis F. Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 7. A Morning Hymn Awake, my soul, and with the sun thy daily stage of duty run. Shake off dull sloth, and joyful rise to pay thy morning sacrifice. Thy precious time misspent, redeem each present day thy last esteem improve thy talent with due care for the great day thyself prepare by influence of the light divine let thy own light to others shine reflect all heaven's propitious rays in ardent love and cheerful praise wake and lift up thyself my heart and with the angels bear thy part who all night long unwearied sing high praise to the eternal king all praise to thee who safe has kept and hast refreshed me whilst i slept grant o lord when i from death shall wake i may of endless light partake direct control suggest this day all i design or do or say that all my power with all their might in thy sole glory may unite praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise father son and holy ghost this is the other of bishop ken's immortal poems spoken of under number four there are fourteen verses in all the last verse it is the last verse of number four also is used separately as the long meter doxology and is oftener sung than any verse in the language in harper's magazine for december eighteen ninety seven richard harding davis gives an account of its splendid effect as sung at the queen's jubilee open-air service before st paul's cathedral in london in june of that year there were ten thousand people singing praise god from whom all blessings flow as loudly as they could and with tears running down their faces there were princesses standing up in their carriages and black men from the gold coast maharajas from india and red-coated tommies and young men who will inherit kingdoms and empires and archbishops and cynical old diplomats and soldiers and sailors from the land of the palm and the pine 
and from the seven seas and women and men who were just subjects of the queen and who were content with that there was probably never before such a moment in which so many races of people of so many castes and of such different values to this world sang praises to god at one time and in one place and with one heart eight hymn for christmas day hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild god and sinners reconciled joyful all ye nations rise join the triumph of the skies with the angelic host proclaim christ is born in bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the new-born king christ by highest heaven adored christ the everlasting lord late in time behold him come offspring of the virgin's womb veiled in flesh the godhead see hail the incarnate deity pleased as man with men to dwell jesus our emmanuel hark the herald angels sing glory to the new-born king hail the heaven-born prince of peace hail the son of righteousness light and life to all he brings risen with healing in his wings mild he lays his glory by born that man no more may die born to raise the sons of earth born to give them second birth hark the herald angels sing glory to the new-born king in seventeen thirty nine appeared the first of the hymn books which the wesleys prepared for the methodists see under number three in this book was a christmas hymn by charles wesley beginning hark how all the welkin rings from time to time changes were made in the hymn by one editor and another until in eighteen ten it took the form here printed in which it is sung in so many churches at christmas time nine abide with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent st luke twenty four twenty nine abide with me fast falls the eventide the darkness deepens lord with me abide when other helpers fail and comforts flee help of the helpless o oh, abide with me swift to its close ebbs out life's little day earth's joys grow dim its glories pass away change and decay in all around i see o thou who changest not abide with me i need thy presence every passing hour what but thy grace can foil the tempter's power who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine o abide with me i fear no foe with thee at hand to bless ills have no weight and tears no bitterness where is death's sting where grave thy victory i triumph still if thou abide with me hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes shine through the gloom and point me to the skies heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee in life in death o lord abide with me this hymn was written by the rev henry francis light see under number five a few weeks before his death and had eight verses in all his daughter tells us that on september fourth eighteen forty seven he preached for the last time in the village church having been ordered to a warmer climate as his only chance of living through the winter and on the evening of that day he placed the hymn in the hands of one of his family it is the prayer of one who feels the night of death closing around him and is not afraid while the master stays beside him mr light died at nice italy on the twentieth of november following end of part three hymns ten eleven and twelve of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain ten the heavenly jerusalem revelation twenty one and twenty two jerusalem my happy home name ever dear to me 
when shall my labours have an end in joy and peace and thee when shall these eyes thy heaven-built walls and pearly gates behold thy bulwarks with salvation strong and streets of shining gold there happier bowers than eden's bloom nor sin nor sorrow know blessed seats through rude and stormy scenes i onward press to you why should i shrink at pain and woe or feel at death dismay i've canaan's goodly land in view and realms of endless day apostles martyrs prophets there around my saviour stand and soon my friends in christ below will join the glorious band jerusalem my happy home my soul still pants for thee then shall my labours have an end when i thy joys shall see in the british museum in london there is a manuscript book as old as queen elizabeth's time which contains a copy of a hymn beginning like this one and it bears the title a song made by f b p to the tune of diana some one took the words and thoughts of a few verses out of the old hymn and made them over into this hymn which was printed about seventeen ninety six in a little hymn book for the use of eckington church in england james montgomery the poet edited the little hymn book and very likely it was he who rewrote the hymn eleven the name of jesus solomon song one three how sweet the name of jesus sounds in a believer's ear it soothes his sorrows heals his wounds and drives away his fear it makes the wounded spirit whole and calms the troubled breast tis manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest dear name the rock on which i build my shield and hiding place my never-failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace by thee my prayers acceptance gain although with sin defiled satan accuses me in vain and i am owned a child jesus my shepherd brother friend my prophet priest and king my lord my life my way my end accept the praise i bring weak is the effort of my heart and cold my warmest thought but when i see thee as thou art i'll praise thee as i ought till then i would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath and may the music of thy name refresh my soul in death it is touching to think that this hymn by the rev john newton so filled with love and tender reverence was written by one whose earlier life was wild and profligate who was a deserter from the english navy and then engaged in the slave trade during a terrible storm at sea he turned his back upon that old life and gave his heart to christ returning to england he was ordained to the ministry in seventeen sixty four at the age of thirty nine and became curate of the village of olney there he became intimate with the poet cooper and they both wrote hymns to be sung at weekly prayer meetings which newton held in an empty house in seventeen seventy nine three hundred and forty eight of these hymns were published in a book called olney hymns two hundred and eighty of them including this one were by newton and sixty-eight were by cooper newton lived to be eighty-two years old twelve nearer my god to thee nearer my god to thee nearer to thee e'en though it be a cross that raiseth me still all my song shall be nearer my god to thee nearer to thee though like the wanderer the sun gone down darkness be over me my rest a stone yet in my dreams i'd be nearer my god to thee nearer to thee there let the way appear steps unto heaven all that thou sendest to me in mercy given angels to beckon me nearer my god to thee nearer to thee then with my waking thoughts bright with thy praise out of my stony griefs bethel i'll raise so by my woes to be nearer my god to thee nearer to thee 
or if on joyful wing cleaving the sky sun moon and stars forgot upwards i fly still all my song shall be nearer my god to thee nearer to thee an english lady mrs sarah flower adams wrote this hymn for a hymnal published by her pastor in eighteen forty one she was a good woman who wore out her own life in ministering to an afflicted sister she was an unitarian which explains why the hymn does not appeal to christ whom we love to think of as the way to god to understand the second third and fourth verses it is necessary to know the story of jacob's dream as told in genesis twenty eight end of part four hymns thirteen fourteen and fifteen of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain thirteen before a collection made for the society for the propagation of the gospel from greenland's icy mountains from india's coral strand where afric's sunny fountains roll down their golden sand from many an ancient river from many a palmy plain they call us to deliver their land from error's chain what though the spicy breezes blow soft o'er ceylon's isle though every prospect pleases and only man is vile in vain with lavish kindness the gifts of god were strown the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone can we whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high can we to men benighted the lamp of life deny salvation o oh salvation the joyful sound proclaim till each remotest nation has learned messiah's name waft waft ye winds his story and you ye waters roll till like a sea of glory it spreads from pole to pole till o'er our ransomed nature the lamb for sinners slain redeemer king creator in bliss returns to reign reginald heber born 1783 wrote this stirring hymn one saturday in 1819 for a missionary service to be held next day at the church in wrexham england of which his father-in-law was pastor when he read it aloud his father-in-law said there that will do very well and it has done very well ever since dr theodore cuyler once said that heber did more for the spread of the gospel by writing this hymn than if he had founded a board of missions it is only one of many good hymns which heber wrote he was afterwards bishop of calcutta where he did noble work for christ until his death in eighteen twenty six fourteen psalm ninety verses one through five first part man frail and god eternal our god our help in ages past our hope for years to come our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home under the shadow of thy throne thy saints have dwelt secure sufficient is thine arm alone and our defence is sure before the hills in order stood or earth received her frame from everlasting thou art god to endless years the same a thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun the busy tribes of flesh and blood with all their lives and cares are carried downwards by thy flood and lost in following years time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away they fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day our god our help in ages past our hope for years to come be thou our guard while troubles last and our eternal home this is a part of one of the free versions or imitations of the psalms see under number two which dr watts published in seventeen nineteen it is one of the very best of all the hymns he wrote to understand the hymn it is only necessary to read the earliest verses of the ninetieth psalm fifteen jerusalem the golden 
jerusalem the golden with milk and honey blessed beneath thy contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed i know not oh i know not what joys await us there what radiancy of glory what bliss beyond compare they stand those halls of zion all jubilant with song and bright with many an angel and all the martyr throng the prince is ever in them the daylight is serene the pastures of the blessed are decked in glorious sheen there is the throne of david and there from care released the song of them that triumph the shout of them that feast and they who with their leader have conquered in the fight for ever and for ever are clad in robes of white o mine my golden zion o lovelier far than gold with laurel girt battalions and safe victorious fold o sweet and blessed country shall i ever see thy face o sweet and blessed country shall i ever win thy grace exult o dust and ashes the lord shall be thy part his only and for ever thou shalt be and thou art exult o dust and ashes the lord shall be thy part his only and for ever thou shalt be and thou art in the twelfth century bernard a monk in the french abbey of cluny wrote a long latin poem which contrasted the evils of the world with the happiness and beauty of heaven an english clergyman dr john mason neal in eighteen fifty one published a translation of four hundred lines of the poem and from this the verses are taken which make up our hymn dr neal lived to see the hymn become the most popular of all hymns about heaven but what pleased him most was to be told that a little child who was a great sufferer became so fond of the verses that he would lie without a murmur or motion while the whole four hundred lines were read to him End of part five hymns sixteen seventeen and eighteen of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain sixteen thy kingdom come lo he comes with clouds descending once for favoured sinners slain thousand thousand saints attending swell the triumph of his train alleluia god appears on earth to reign every eye shall now behold him robed in dreadful majesty those who set at naught and sold him pierced and nailed him to the tree deeply wailing shall the true messiah see every island sea and mountain heaven and earth shall flee away all who hate him must confounded hear the trump proclaim the day come to judgment come to judgment come away now redemption long expected see in solemn pomp appear all his saints by man rejected now shall meet him in the air alleluia see the day of god appear answer thine own bride and spirit hasten lord the general doom the new heaven and earth to inherit take thy pining exiles home all creation travails groans and bids thee come yea amen let all adore thee high on thine eternal throne saviour take the power and glory claim the kingdom for thine own o oh, come quickly alleluia come lord come parts of three separate hymns are woven together in this in seventeen sixty the rev mr madden was making a hymn-book for the church of england and wished a hymn upon the second coming of christ he took these first second and sixth verses from one and the fifth verse from another hymn of charles wesley see under number three and the third and fourth from a hymn by john kinnock see under number twenty nine and then made several changes in them before his hymn suited him it seems like a strange way of making a hymn but the hymn is among the best we have on the subject seventeen psalm seventy two second part christ's kingdom among the gentiles jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run 
his kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more for him shall endless prayer be made and praises strong to crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice people and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name blessings abound where'er he reigns the prisoner leaps to lose his chains the weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed let every creature rise and bring peculiar honours to our king angels descend with songs again and earth repeat the loud amen this is another of the imitations of the psalms which dr watts published in seventeen nineteen see under number two an incident will best illustrate the meaning of the hymn one day in eighteen sixty two king george of the south sea islands was to give a new constitution to his people exchanging a heathen for a christian form of government under the spreading branches of the banyan trees sat some five thousand natives assembled for divine worship foremost among them all sat king george himself around him were seated old chiefs and warriors but old and young alike rejoiced together in the joys of that day it would be impossible to describe the deep feeling manifested when the solemn service began by the entire assembly singing the hymn jesus shall reign where'er the sun who so much as they could realize the meaning of the poet's words for they had been rescued from the darkness of heathenism and cannibalism and they were that day met for the first time under a christian constitution and with christ himself reigning in the hearts of most of them that was indeed christ's kingdom set up in the earth eighteen zion or the city of god isaiah chapter thirty three verses twenty to twenty one glorious things of thee are spoken zion city of our god he whose word cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode on the rock of ages founded what can shake thy sure repose with salvation's walls surrounded thou mayst smile at all thy foes see the streams of living waters springing from eternal love well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to assuage grace which like the lord the giver never fails from age to age round each habitation hovering see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a covering showing that the lord is near thus deriving from their banner light by night and shade by day safe they feed upon the manna which he gives them when they pray saviour if of zion's city i through grace a member am let the world deride or pity i will glory in thy name fading is the worldling's pleasure all his boasted pomp and show solid joys and lasting treasure none but zion's children know this is another of the hymns which the rev john newton published in olney hymns see under number eleven the poet thinks of the church of christ as a great city in which god has his dwelling and in which all christians are fellow-citizens and he thanks god for the privilege and honour of being a member of his church end of part six hymns nineteen twenty and twenty one of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain nineteen christ's message from luke four verses eighteen to nineteen hark the glad sound the saviour comes the saviour promise long let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song on him the spirit largely poured exerts its sacred fire wisdom and might and zeal and love his holy breast inspire he comes the prisoners to release in satan's bondage held the gates of brass before him burst the iron fetters yield 
he comes from the thick films of vice to clear the mental ray and on the eyeballs of the blind to pour celestial day he comes the broken heart to bind the bleeding soul to cure and with the treasures of his grace to enrich the humble poor our glad hosannas prince of peace thy welcome shall proclaim and heaven's eternal arches ring with thy beloved name the rev dr philip doddridge born seventeen o two died seventeen fifty one wrote this hymn but it was never printed till after his death he was a great friend of dr watts and wrote very many hymns of which this perhaps is the best it is a song of welcome to greet the coming advent of christ to be our saviour just as if the poet had been present in the nazareth synagogue when jesus read the prophet's words about himself and the poet had taken those words from his mouth and made them into a song see st luke four eighteen nineteen twenty christ jesus the lamb of god worshipped by all the creation revelation five verses eleven twelve and thirteen come let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne ten thousand thousand are their tongues but all their joys are one worthy the lamb that died they cry to be exalted thus worthy the lamb our lips reply for he was slain for us jesus is worthy to receive honour and power divine and blessings more than we can give be lord for ever thine let all that dwell above the sky and earth and air and seas conspire to lift thy glories high and speak thine endless praise the whole creation join in one to bless the sacred name of him that sits upon the throne and to adore the lamb this is another of dr watts's hymns see under number two he calls upon us to join in the worship of the angels about god's throne in heaven of which st john tells us in the verses from revelation referred to in the title of the hymn twenty one on the resurrection the lord is king all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all crown him ye morning stars of light who fixed this floating ball now hail the strength of israel's might and crown him lord of all crown him ye martyrs of your god who from his altar call extol the stem of jesse's rod and crown him lord of all ye seed of israel's chosen race ye ransomed of the fall hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him lord of all sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him lord of all let every kindred every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all o oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and crown him lord of all this is often called the coronation hymn it appears in the gospel magazine for april seventeen eighty and was written by edward perronet he was born in seventeen twenty six was brought up in the church of england and became one of john wesley's helpers see under number three afterward he was pastor of an independent church in canterbury where he died in seventeen ninety two and was buried in the cloisters of the famous cathedral in life he was full of fire and enthusiasm and some of it burns yet in his spirited hymn the sixth verse as almost always sung now and as printed here was a good deal changed from what perronet wrote by an editor dr rippon in seventeen eighty seven and he added this seventh verse to the hymn end of part seven hymns twenty two twenty three and twenty four of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty two the reign of christ on earth psalm seventy two hail to the lord's anointed great david's greater son hail in the time appointed his reign on earth begun 
he comes to break oppression to set the captive free to take away transgression and rule in equity he shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth and love joy hope like flowers spring in his path to birth before him on the mountains shall peace the herald go and righteousness in fountains from hill to valley flow kings shall fall down before him and gold and incense bring all nations shall adore him his praise all people sing for he shall have dominion o'er river sea and shore far as the eagle's pinion or dove's light wing can soar for him shall prayer unceasing and daily vows ascend his kingdom still increasing a kingdom without end the mountain dew shall nourish a seed in weakness sown whose fruit shall spread and flourish and shake like lebanon o'er every foe victorious he on his throne shall rest from age to age more glorious all blessing and all blessed the tide of time shall never his covenant remove his name shall stand for ever that name to us is love james montgomery the author of this hymn was born in seventeen seventy one and was for many years editor of a newspaper in sheffield england he was also quite celebrated as a poet his poems are not much read now but some of his hymns are among the best we have this one was written in eighteen twenty one and montgomery used sometimes to recite it at the close of a speech at a public missionary meeting it was very appropriate at such a time because like the seventy-second psalm of which it is an imitation it draws a picture of the glad time when christ's kingdom shall cover all the earth twenty three psalm one hundred and four o worship the king all glorious above o gratefully sing his power and his love our shield and defender the ancient of days pavilioned in splendour and girded with praise o tell of his might o sing of his grace whose robe is the light whose canopy space his chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path on the wings of the storm the earth with its store of wonders untold almighty thy power hath found it of old hath established it fast by a changeless decree and round it hath cast like a mantle the sea thy bountiful care what tongue can recite it breathes in the air it shines in the light it streams from the hills it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend o measureless might ineffable love while angels delight to him thee above the humbler creation though feeble their lays with true adoration shall lisp to thy praise this hymn gives us some of the thoughts about god's greatness and love that are contained in the one hundred and fourth psalm it was written by sir robert grant who in eighteen thirty four was appointed english governor of bombay india and died there in eighteen thirty eight twenty four hymn for easter day christ the lord is risen to-day sons of men and angels say raise your joys and triumphs high sing ye heavens and earth reply vain the stone the watch the seal christ has burst the gates of hell death in vain forbids his rise christ has opened paradise lives again our glorious king where o death is now thy sting once he died our souls to save where thy victory o grave soar we now where christ has led following our exalted head made like him like him we rise ours the cross the grave the skies hail the lord of earth and heaven praise to thee by both be given thee we greet triumphant now hail the resurrection thou this is part of one of the hymns of charles wesley and was printed in the same book as his christmas hymn number eight 
End part eight. Hymns 25, 26, and 27 of the best church hymns by Louis F. Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 25. Praying for Strength. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more open now the crystal fountain whence the healing stream doth flow let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through strong deliverer be thou still my strength and shield when i tread the verge of jordan bid my anxious fear subside death of deaths and hell's destruction land me safe on canaan's side songs of praises i will ever give to thee this hymn was first written in the welsh language by the rev william williams a clergyman of wales and was printed in his book of hymns in seventeen forty five about twenty seven years afterward he printed this english version of his hymn the first verse of it made by his brother the other verses by himself the writer thinks of our life as a march across the desert to the better land like that journey of the israelites of which we read in exodus and he thinks of god as leading us and feeding us now as he did his people then twenty six him that cometh unto me i will in no wise cast out john six thirty seven just as i am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee o lamb of god i come just as i am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot o lamb of god i come just as i am though tossed about with many a conflict many a doubt fightings and fears within without o lamb of god i come just as i am poor wretched blind sight riches healing of the mind yea all i need in thee to find o lamb of god i come just as i am thou wilt receive wilt welcome pardon cleanse relieve because thy promise i believe o lamb of god i come just as i am thy love unknown has broken every barrier down now to be thine yea thine alone o lamb of god i come the authoress of this hymn miss charlotte elliot of brighton england was born in seventeen eighty nine and was an invalid nearly all her life till her death in eighteen seventy one this is one of several hymns she wrote for a little book she made in eighteen thirty six intended to help and comfort other sick people she never dreamed that it would come to be loved by everybody twenty seven light shining out of darkness god moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will ye fearful saints fresh courage take the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head judge not the lord by feeble sense but trust him for his grace behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face his purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour the bud may have a bitter taste but sweet will be the flower blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain god is his own interpreter and he will make it plain the famous poet william cooper born 1731 died 1800 wrote this hymn straight from the heart it was first printed in 1774 in a little book of letters on religious subjects which cooper's friend john newton published while they were living together in olney see under number 11 there are times in the life of every one when the ways of god's providence seem dark and hard to understand but cooper's lot was made particularly hard by brain trouble which made him subject to fits of insanity 
under the shadow of one of these dreadful attacks he wrote this hymn of trust in god's providence End part nine hymns twenty eight twenty nine and thirty of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty eight the most holy name of jesus jesus the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest nor voice can sing nor heart can frame nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name o saviour of mankind o hope of every contrite heart o joy of all the meek to those who fall how kind thou art how good to those who seek but what to those who find ah this nor tongue nor pen can show the love of jesus what it is none but his loved ones know jesus our only joy be thou as thou our prize wilt be jesus be thou our glory now and through eternity like number fifteen this hymn is translated from the latin and the original of this as of that was written by a monk and the name of the writer of each was the same bernard but the other bernard was an obscure monk in the abbey of cluny while the writer of this bernard of clairvaux born 1091 died 1153 was head of the abbey of that name an orator scholar and statesman and indeed one of the most prominent figures in the history of the middle ages he had beautiful thoughts in his heart and expressed some of them in lovely hymns these five verses are from a translation of his hymn upon the name of jesus made by the rev edward caswell in eighteen forty nine caswell was then a clergyman in the church of england but in the next year joined the roman catholic church twenty nine a hymn for the children of god in the days of their pilgrimage children of the heavenly king as ye journey sweetly sing sing your saviour's worthy praise glorious in his works and ways we are travelling home to god in the way the fathers trod they are happy now and we soon their happiness shall see shout ye little flock and blessed ye on jesus throne shall rest there your seat is now prepared there your kingdom and reward lift your eyes ye sons of light zion city is in sight there our endless home shall be there our lord we soon shall see fear not brethren joyful stand on the borders of your land jesus christ your father's son bids you undismayed go on lord obediently we go gladly leaving all below only thou our leader be and we still will follow thee the author of this hymn was the rev john chinnick born 1718 he was at one time a helper of the wesleys in the methodist meetings see under number three and afterward a clergyman in the moravian church he published this in seventeen forty two with many other hymns and died at the early age of thirty-eight years it is pleasant to think of him as safely home while we travellers sing his cheerful hymn thirty a prospect of heaven makes death easy there is a land of pure delight where saints immortal reign infinite day excludes the night and pleasures banish pain there everlasting spring abides and never withering flowers death like a narrow sea divides this heavenly land from ours sweet fields beyond the swelling flood stand dressed in living green so to the jews old canaan stood while jordan rolled between but timorous mortals start and shrink to cross this narrow sea and linger shivering on the brink and fear to launch away oh could we make our doubts remove those gloomy doubts that rise and see the canaan that we love with unbeclouded eyes could we but climb where moses stood and view the landscape o'er not jordan's stream nor death's cold flood should fright us from the shore another hymn by dr watts see under number two one of the first he wrote but published with the others in seventeen o seven this hymn carries forward the thought of number twenty five 
god has led now the children of israel all the way to the river jordan which alone separates them from the promised land and they should not be afraid that he will not take them safely across nor fear to step into the waters and the crossing of jordan has been ever since an image of the christian's death and canaan an image of heaven we need not be afraid of death while we look toward heaven End of part ten hymns thirty one and thirty two of the best church hymns by lewis f benson this librivox recording is in the public domain thirty one missionary hymn thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight hear us we humbly pray and where the gospel's day sheds not its glorious ray let there be light thou who didst come to bring on thy redeeming wing healing and sight health to the sick in mind sight to the inly blind o oh, now to all mankind let there be light spirit of truth and love life-giving holy dove speed forth thy flight move o'er the water's face bearing the lamp of grace and in earth's darkest place let there be light holy and blessed three glorious trinity wisdom love might boundless as ocean's tide rolling in fullest pride through the world far and wide let there be light this hymn was written about eighteen thirteen by the rev john marriott pastor of a country church in england in genesis one two and three we are told how the spirit of god moved over the waters before the earth had taken shape and how god's voice called through the dark let there be light and now the poet prays that god will send his holy spirit with the light of christ's gospel to all places in the world that are dark with sin and shame thirty two brief life is here our portion brief life is here our portion brief sorrow short-lived care the life that knows no ending the tearless life is there o oh, happy retribution short toil eternal rest for mortals and for sinners a mansion with the blest and now we fight the battle but then shall wear the crown of full and everlasting and passionless renown and now we watch and struggle and now we live in hope and zion in her anguish with babylon must cope but he whom now we trust in shall then be seen and known and they that know and see him shall have him for their own the morning shall awaken and shadows shall decay and each true-hearted servant shall shine as doth the day yes god my king and portion in fulness of his grace we then shall see for ever and worship face to face this the last but certainly not the least beautiful of our thirty-two hymns was not written as a separate and complete hymn it consists of verses taken from dr neale's translation of the poem of bernard from which jerusalem the golden also was taken and which is described under that hymn number fifteen and part eleven here ends the best church hymns by lewis f benson